So, uh, welcome to everybody. I am Laszlo Semikoshi from the Budapest Neutron Center, and I would like to uh, talk this time about neutron imaging and uh, from gamma activation analysis. So, these are two methods which can be used uh, to um, determine either the structure or the chemical elemental composition of samples. Um, uh, as you probably heard already, neutrons have a dual nature. It can uh, act either as a particle or as a wave. And uh, we have a, a portfolio of methods that can uh, take advantage of these uh, properties. So neutrons can interact uh, with the matter either uh, by inducing nuclear reactions like uh, neutron capture or neutron induced fission or uh, scattering or reflection can happen, which uh, lies mostly on the wavelength nature, or uh, mostly uh, uh, the unaffected neutrons just pass through the sample. And uh, uh, in the present lecture, I will talk about the transmitted neutrons, which uh, is utilized in neutron imaging. And I always, uh, I also uh, mention uh, from gamma activation analysis, which is based on uh, a certain nuclear reaction, which is called uh, radiative neutron capture. So first uh, part of the lecture will be dedicated to neutron imaging, which can be further divided into categories. Uh, uh, so if we stick to two dimensional imaging, uh, the phrase is called radiography where we just uh, record a shadow image uh, of the object. If we make it time dependent and de determine it by uh, uh, time, then we can create a video. This is called dynamic radiography. Um, if we make a three-dimensional visualization of the object, that is called tomography and uh, in the most advanced case, you can even make time results tomography, where you can uh, visualize the time dependence in, in 3D. So these will be uh, very briefly mentioned and discussed in the first part of the lecture. Um, so radiography is a, a technique, which literally means a drawing with the radiation which converts the otherwise invisible radiation or the invisible interaction between radiation and matter into tangible visible shadow images by observing the modification of an incident beam, particle beam, which can be either neutrons or uh, in many other cases, X-rays, for instance, uh, as this uh, radiation propagates through the sample and <clears throat> the sample modifies uh, its uh, local intensity. And uh, once we transilluminate the object, um, we will record um, a two-dimensional image, which is called radiogram. Uh, each material has a property to modify the beam intensity either by absorption, so that means uh, the, the atoms uh, absorb the neutrons, or scattering, which means uh, the, the propagation direction is changed. And th this can be quantified uh, uh, by this equation. Um, most of the people already know x-ray imaging because uh, it is just if you go to the doctor and have an x-ray chest uh, inspection. Um, in case of x-rays, the attenuation coefficient, which is responsible to the, the contrast, changes uh, smoothly versus the atomic number. So here you see these uh, lines for different uh, X-ray uh, and uh, gamma energies. Uh, while for neutrons, this uh, attenuation coefficient changes dramatically between several uh, elements or even between the isotopes of the same element. Uh, so uh, this uh, here you can see, for instance, uh, regular water and heavy water, and you can see one order of magnitude difference. 
So uh, the, the reason of this is that uh, neutrons interact with the atomic nucleus, while X-rays interact with the electron shell. So neutrons can be uh, isotope sensitive, uh, while X-rays cannot. And this is a very significant difference. The other uh, significance is that neighboring elements can have very much different uh, attenuation coefficients for neutrons, while uh, for X-rays, these uh, curves are rather smooth. So to quantify this uh, ability of the material to modify the incoming uh, particle beam, we have this mass attenuation coefficient, which is uh, uh, the, the proportion of the linear attenuation coefficient and the, the sample density. And we, we can also uh, write uh, the pierre Lambert law, which is uh, valid for the most ideal circumstances. So the, the transmission intensity over the impinging intensity uh, equals to the uh, uh, exponent uh, with the attenuation co coefficient multiplied by the, the thickness. Uh, so we either know the material and measure the thickness, or we know the geometry and uh, try to unfold the, the mu, which is the property of certain materials. Uh, neutron uh, radiography has a quite long history and dates back uh, to the 30s. Uh, this, uh, technically, it became a major in the 60s, 70s, while uh, it gained a significance only later uh, in industrial uh, routine applications. I just wanted to uh, remind you that here is a, in this uh, uh, review paper, our facility was also mentioned as a milestone of the development of neutron radiography. Presently, uh, there are not too many neutron imaging facilities all around the world. So the leading facilities are concentrated in Europe, in uh, United States and in uh, Asia. Uh, what do, you, do we need to, to set up a, an imaging facility? Of course, we need source of, of neutrons, which can be uh, made more effective by a, a moderator or even a co-neutron source. And we need a collimator, which will create a parallel beam of, of the particles, the neutrons. And we can apply op optionally filters to get rid of the unwanted components of the radiation. We might need a fly tube, which will deliver the neutrons from the source to the sample. And uh, we might need a, a detector, which is sensitive to detect uh, the particles of interest with a spatial resolution. We need a sample manipulator that can uh, translate and rotate the sample. And of course, we need a shutter uh, to allow the safe operation of the facility. Um, collimation is a very crucial component of the imaging station because our goal is to have a very flat intensity distribution of the screen so that uh, good quality images could be obtained. And uh, uh, the other goal is to reduce the size of this penum penumbra region where the intensity drops. And because uh, in that area, you might have uh, more noise and uh, it will, would compromise the beam quality. Um, once you design this collimator system, there is another uh, parameter that you have to uh, take care which is the so-called L over T ratio. L is the, the path length of the uh, radiation from the source to the sample. And D is the dimension of the neutron source. And uh, the, the smaller is D and the larger is L, you have a more uh, parallelized uh, neutron beam. So the the blur and the distortion related to your uh, beam 
will be smaller. But on the other hand, if you reduce the source area or increase the flight path, then you lose intensity. So you should find a proper a compromise between the intensity of the beam and the parallelity of the beam. So interestingly, uh, you can place most of the facilities uh, on, on such plot where a different uh, um, facilities, different compromises are made regarding uh, neutron beam intensity and neutron beam parallelism. And just to demonstrate what's the impact of this, if you have a poorly parallel beam, then your image will be quite blurred. While if your beam is very parallel, then the image will be sharp. So this is very, very crucial. In the modern days, uh, we use digital image detectors. Uh, and this is also the case in our uh, radiography station, which is named Drat. So the, the reactor uh, is right here, and here is the beam port. And we have the neutron beam coming out uh, from the reactor towards our detector. And this detector is uh, made of several key components. And uh, the first is that uh, the entire sink has to be placed in a light type box, because the technology converts neutrons into visible light. And in fact, at the end of the process, the visible light is detected. We need, of course, a sample platform where we can place our sample, which can be moved up and down, and it can accommodate also a turntable. Uh, we have a scintillator screen, which is typically made of lithium-6 fluoride doped uh, zinc sulfide. So it works like the old-fashioned TV screens. And uh, it uh, converts the impinging neutrons to visible light photons. And these uh, visible light photons are reflected by a, a large and very flat mirror uh, uh, out of the beam uh, direction. And with uh, a set of optics, we will uh, focus the, the light on a CCD or SCMOS chip which will finally record uh, the image. And in, in our case, the images are stored in form of uh, TIFF files, which is uh, 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 easy to op open by any common image processing programs. So as I mentioned, a scintillator screen is a very crucial component. And uh, usually at a facility, we have um, many different uh, scintillators available. So you can optimize uh, for the particular imaging uh, exercise. Uh, so the materials can be different. Either this uh, zinc sulfide-based scintillators are common, or the other uh, common type is called GADOX, which is gadolinium oxide. And also the thickness can be varied. And uh, again, uh, you make uh, a compromise between or a trade off between the light yield and the spatial resolution, as it is illustrated right here. Uh, once we recorded the, the image, the, the upcoming question is how, what is the resolution? So, uh, imaging uh, is uh, uh, the history of imaging is typically hunting for better and better spatial resolution. In order to um, define the spatial resolution in a, a coherent way, people introduced uh, this uh, pattern, which is called the cement star. It's uh, uh, gadolinium stripes arranged in, in this ring structure. And uh, uh, this is this object uh, can be used to benchmark the performance of the image detector system. So if uh, these spokes can be very well resolved, then uh, your um, resolution is uh, reaching this, let's say, 200 or 100 micron. In the most advanced uh, facilities or detectors, uh, you can go even beyond and 
uh, reach uh, spatial resolution down to 40 microns, which is really excellent. Uh, but this device is only applicable to two-dimensional resolution assessment. So if uh, three-dimensional resolution is uh, the question, then uh, a set of titanium uh, spheres are used where you reconstruct the distributions and then you assess the transition between air and the material. And this uh, edge straight function can be mathematically evaluated and the um, resolution value can be determined. Um, as I mentioned, uh, so far we, we were speaking of uh, radiography, which was two-dimensional. But uh, there is a, a need for going beyond this and recording three-dimensional uh, structural data of objects, uh, which is called tomography. Tomography is technically an extension of radiography, where the visualization uh, in 3D is achieved using uh, computational algorithms that are uh, working on a series of radiographic uh, projections uh, that are taken uh, at the incremental uh, small uh, rotation of the object. So in fact, we record um, several hundreds of these so-called projections, so shadow images. And with mathematical algorithms, we create uh, horizontal uh, x, y uh, maps of the attenuation coefficient. And by stacking these along the z-axis, we have this three-dimensional uh, attenuation map, which can be then uh, visualized by volume rendering. So the applications of neutron imaging is very widespread. Uh, it is probably the most requested method by the industry. It's very well uh, applicable to industrial uh, research and development and also for quality assurance uh, exercises. Neutrons are very sensitive to hydrogen, unlike X-rays. So um, many, in many applications, uh, uh, people take advantage of the sensitivity of the, of the methods towards hydrogen. And in this example, you can find uh, the crude oil uh, spherules in, in uh, the, the sand matrix. If we make uh, a neutron tomogram and an X-ray tomogram, and then we compare the two 3D distributions. Uh, again, um, you can uh, use very well these methods for industrial quality assurance exercises. So here, we investigated uh, casting uh, template remains um, in industrial turbine blades. And uh, here you can see uh, the cooling channels of this uh, turbine blade very well. And if one, one is blocked by a casting template, then uh, the heat balance of the turbine will be disturbed and uh, sooner or later it will break. So it's very crucial to uh, get knowledge about these uh, imperfections. Here again, uh, we can make use of the existence of hydrogen or sensitivity of the method towards hydrogen, because this is a, a beer, beer double uh, ball bearing and uh, in the upper image you see um, a new one, an original one, while in the bottom image you see uh, a used damaged one. And uh, uh, you can compare that here you see more white areas than down here which means that the grease or the lubricant is uh, well distributed uh, at all places, while in the damaged component, there is lack of grease and lubricant, and probably that was the reason why it broke down. 
Another application of neutron imaging is where uh, high Z elements shall be investigated. This was the case here with tungsten. And uh, uh, this is a, a cutting tool uh, made of uh, tungsten. And uh, even if it is not very large, X-rays cannot penetrate through. So with conventional uh, technology, people couldn't measure these objects. And our exercise was to measure the spatial distribution of the density and compare it with the numerical calculations. And with uh, neutron imaging, this was indeed possible. And uh, uh, as you see, we have very good agreement with the numerical simulation. Uh, we can also use neutron imaging in heritage science. If you compare, this is an arrowhead, uh, the image of the arrowhead by X-ray and neutron image, you can see there is a huge difference inside, which is the broken handle of the, the arrow, and which is totally invisible by X-ray in radiography. Uh, we can actually numerically combine the outcome of the two uh, modalities. So X-ray and neutron images can be fused together to make one composite image. And uh, here you see that, for instance, uh, neutrons revealed that these two uh, little uh, chips were different from the others, which was impossible to differentiate by using only X-rays. Uh, to some extent, uh, neutrons can be used to image time-dependent processes. Uh, the only limitation is the, the frame rate of the detector and the availability of neutrons uh, within that uh, very narrow time window. So the more uh, neutrons we have, the smaller uh, um, time window can be selected and higher frame rate can be achieved. So we uh, the imaging of repetitive processes is called stroboscopic imaging. And uh, for instance, if you check uh, a running engine of a car, then you can synchronize the image recording to the ignition and uh, uh, taking the same set of uh, images over and over and averaging them will uh, um, make it possible to have a, a, a well um, understandable image. But if the process itself is, is on the time scale of seconds or minutes, the imaging uh, can create very nice and impressive videos like uh, how to boil coffee. So this is the, the water, this is the coffee, and this is the coffee maker. And at the end of the process, you have the ready coffee. Or in the same way, you can also study running fuel cells where um, these uh, water condensation in the channels can be uh, investigated. In the same way, you can also use it in uh, uh, phase transition studies. So this is the supercritical transition of the water. and uh, in the supercritical state, you see that uh, there is no interface between gas phase and liquid phase, but the entire volume is homogeneously filled with the material. We can also measure dynamically the water uptake of certain uh, porous materials, and uh, we can quantify their affinity towards water and their porosity using these uh, water uptake studies. This will be demonstrated, by the way, during the lab exercises. So that was the first half of my lecture. And now I, in the second half, I would uh, present you another technique, which is good for elemental composition measurement. It's named PromCam activation analysis. Uh, in this technique, we detect uh, the neutron capture gamma rays and we apply them for the composition measurement. Activation analysis is a branch of the analytical science where uh, in the induced radioactivity or nuclear reactions are used to obtain information 
on the elemental composition of the sample. Uh, interestingly, the first uh, application of onion induced radioactivity for element analysis uh, was made by a fellow Hungarian, uh, George Hevesi, who later became a Nobel laureate. So the neutron activation analysis has some link to Hungary. And um, also a prom gamma activation analysis uh, was uh, recognized a very long time ago, soon after the discovery of the neutrons, where um, uh, it was observed that some kind of penetrative radiation emerged from a bombardment of uh, paraffin by neutrons. And later this was identified by the, the uh, prom gamma radiation of the hydrogen. So the N gamma reaction uh, uh, can be sketched as follows. So we have a, a target nucleus in our sample, and then we start bombarding our sample with neutrons. And some neutrons will be captured and the binding energy of the neutron will create an excitation state of the nucleus, which is called compound nucleus. And uh, uh, compound nu the excess energy of this compound nucleus will be emitted in, most typically in form of uh, gamma radiation and uh, a product nucleus is formed. This can be either stable or it can be radioactive. If, if it's radioactive, then the process goes further and we get another kind of gamma radiation, which is called decay or delayed gamma radiation. But this time it's not coming immediately after the neutron capture, but it is characterized by the half-life. And this is the, the theoretical basis of another analytical technique called instrumental neutron activation analysis. The PGA spectrum looks like this. Uh, it is the distribution of the gamma rays uh, as a function of energy. Uh, it has a very wide energy range from 45 keV to 12 MeV. And it's rather complicated. It can contain several hundreds of uh, Gauss-like peaks on a continuously raising baseline. And the counts in the spectrum follows the Poisson statistics which is very important from the point of view of uncertainty propagation. So these, these methods can exactly give the uncertainties already from one single measurement. And that's why they are very applicable for um, certification and quality assurance uh, applications. So the peak positions in the spectrum provide information about the elements, while the peak areas are proportional to the quantities. And based on this information, both qualitative and quantitative analysis can be made. The method has different analytical sensitivities for uh, different elements or even different isotopes again. There are typically elements which can be measured uh, as a main major component. So uh, like uh, carbon, oxygen, or lead, they can be measured typically in the percentage range, while other elements can be measured down to uh, 10 or 100 microgram, or even beyond. There are a few trace elements where uh, already one microgram uh, can be quantified. So these sensitivities are dictated by the, the nuclear physics properties, and uh, uh, they are determined by the so-called uh, neutron capture cross-section. And these are known and, and tabulated, so it can be used for elemental composition determination. And the basic equation is very simple. So the peak area of, the, of a, an element at a given gamma ray energy is proportional to the mass of the element the measurement time and the factor which is called sens analytical sensitivity. This, this contains some uh, nuclear com components like this, which is available from spectroscopic library. This, co this is called partial gamma ray production cross-section. There is phi, which is the intensity of the impinging neutron beam. Here is efficiency of the detector system. 
and here is a correction uh, which uh, is uh, um, which takes into account the uh, self uh, shielding and self absorption of neutrons and gamma rays already within the sample. So this is uh, mostly for bulky samples only. So in order to have a successful measurement, we need a neutron source, which is in our case uh, the Tendergovat Budapest Research Reactor. We have here a cell which is called cold neutron source, where the average kinetic energy of the neutrons are reduced in order to uh, make it more appropriate for element analysis. Then um, we propagate these neutrons from their production site in the reactor towards the facility by devices called neutron guides. These are light optical devices, just like the fiber optics for visible light. And based on the wavelength nature of the neutrons, they can be propagated to a large distance with a very small uh, losses. So this is a, a crucial tool to achieve high intensity beam uh, at the facilities. And here you see the photo of the sump chamber of the PGA station. Um, the detection uh, is made by a, a very complex uh, detector system. As you saw already, the baseline is completely uh, um, raising towards the low energies. So in order to achieve a low uh, detection limits, we need to keep this baseline very low. And uh, this baseline is uh, the result of the so-called Compton scattering. So it's, it's coming from a fundamental natural processes, so entirely cannot be eliminated, but can be reduced to some extent. So if the sample is here and the gamma radiation comes towards our detector, then uh, it is hopefully fully uh, absorbed in this gray, green area, which is our semiconductor hybrid germanium detector. But if this is not the case, the incoming uh, gamma radiation can be scattered in this volume and part of its energy is leaving this area and going into this uh, light blue uh, sectors of bismuth germinate scintillator detectors. These can uh, convert gamma photons to visible light and uh, they are detected by these photomultiplier tubes. And if we uh, observe a gamma event from this green area and from this light blue area. That means that our photon did not reach, did not deposit all the energy in this uh, volume. And that's why the event will fall somewhere into the background due to the partial energy deposition. And these uh, events are selectively rejected and this technique is called Compton suppression. And of course, the entire detector is uh, inside the 10 centimeter of lead shielding. And uh, as a result of this Compton suppression to the same peak area, we can have one order of magnitude lower baseline. So note that this scale is a logarithmic. And uh, the spectrum is made of uh, the sum of these uh, individual uh, so-called detector response functions. And these uh, Compton plateaus are responsible to the continuously raising baseline. So this is uh, quite essential to reduce its amplitude towards the full energy peak. Of course, in order to have a, a rigorous uh, correspondence between peak area and mass, we need to know the de detector efficiency which is the ratio of detected events over emitted gamma photons as a function of energy. This can be approximated by a six to eight order uh, polynomial on a log log scale. And note that uh, uh, in contrast of the usual uh, gamma spectroscopy applications where this efficiency curve only goes up to 2.5 mega electron volt in this application, we use the energy range up to 
11, 12 mega electron volt. Uh, from this uh, calibration, which we can establish by using commercially available sealed radioactive sources and also some very well known uh, N gamma reactions, we can also reuse, deduce another uh, correction, which is for the energy curve. It's called nonlinearity. This is necessary to compensate for the for a small but systematic bias in the linear energy channel correspondence of the spectrometer, and this ensures the proper energy measurement and thereby the proper assignation of the elements to the analytical peaks. And this assignation is done on the basis of an uh, analytical library, where we have the very accurate energies of the analytical lines for each element. And we have an intensity related quantity, which is the sigma, the so-called partial gamma ray production per section. And here is uh, an approximative uh, analytical sensitivity in units of uh, counts per second per a gram unit. And uh, at the end of the analysis, you will have a uh, table of all identified chemical elements. And here you see the measured masses, the background, the net masses, and then the result can be expressed in, in units of uh, atomic percentages, weight percentages, or in form of uh, oxide composition. Typical samples from Chromcam activation analysis are either difficult to resolve, dissolve or expensive or valuable. So everything where non-destructivity is an important factor. Uh, for small samples or powder samples, uh, we can put them into such uh, Teflon uh, bags. We typically need between 200 milligram and two gram sample masses, but we can also measure uh, liquids in Teflon vials or we can even measure uh, gases in pressurized containers. We should note that uh, some samples remain uh, radioactive for a few hours after the measurement. So we put them aside and uh, store them safely until they decay uh, to the clearance level. And afterwards, it can be reused uh, uh, without any restriction. So some sample types we uh, analyze are from uh, heritage science domain, where you can find silicate samples, ceramics, metals, or glasses uh, as typical uh, matrices. We can also mention geology, where the uh, advantage is that you don't need to digest or, or di uh, dissolve your sample, which is uh, difficult for some uh, geological materials. And this is also valid for cosmochemistry. We can measure uh, paleontological samples as well, uh, material science samples, uh, which have to be characterized by many techniques, and it's not allowed to uh, dissolve the material and lose uh, its uh, masses. We can very well measure uh, materials relevant to nuclear uh, materials or nuclear energy production. And uh, recently we started uh, to uh, turn towards uh, measurement of uh, waste materials to sustain a uh, circular economy. A few uh, interesting examples uh, are listed here. And the first example comes from uh, uh, the bottom of the ocean. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a very rare and unique sample, which was uh, brought to the surface by uh, the Alvin uh, submarine of the United States. And they sampled uh, so-called deep sea vents, uh, where hot water uh, comes in contact with the cold ocean and several minerals are deposited. And this is a good indicator of the volcanic activity uh, below the, the sea or the ocean uh, ground. And uh, these very unique and very expensive samples were determined 
or investigated by uh, program activation analysis. And it was found that uh, sulfates of uh, copper and iron uh, made uh, the highest uh, contribution of these uh, samples. Um, and this method is also applicable to the in situ studies. So time dependent processes can be measured and probed. Uh, in this example, we use the heterogeneous chemical catalysis and we measured the adsorption and absorption of certain materials uh, to the surface and subsurface of the solid uh, catalyst material. And uh, at the same time, we also did a conventional uh, gas chromatography or, or titration and by cross correlating the elemental composition uh, changes and the chemical yield measurements, one can conclude about the reaction mechanism and uh, optimize the temperature, pressure and flow uh, conditions uh, of a certain chemical reaction for industrial applications. Uh, as neutrons and gamma rays can both penetrate deep into the material, um, we can have information from the deep layers of the samples. So if you imagine we have a bulky sample like this one, and you are interested in to know the composition somewhere in the middle, this is indeed possible by program activation analysis without uh, any destructive sampling. Um, the measurement of this uh, uh, small confined volume within a large object is called program activation imaging and it's uh, implemented uh, at our uh, NIPS normal station. So the principle is like this. We have a strong collimation of the impinging neutron beam and at the same time a strong collimation of the gamma detector. And these two things have an intersection which defines the sampling volume. And the procedure is as follows. First, we can make uh, a tomography of the su a sample by rotating it and using the downstream placed neutron camera, which is uh, here. And this is the so-called normal station. And once we know the structure of the sample, we can identify uh, interesting parts and using the same third table without uh, touching the object, we can translate it or rotate it to the relevant measurement position and acquire a gamma spectrum by this gamma spectrometer, which is called NIPS. And uh, this will give you the composition of that selected volume. So this NIPS normal station is the only facility in the world which has this integrated feature of element analysis and neutron imaging. But, and I would like to present here an example, which is the which is a, a cell piece of ceramics from recovered from a tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh, and uh, it it had some material inside, but neither terahertz imaging nor X-ray imaging was able to reveal what is inside. And here came again the advantage of neutrons uh, over X-rays because um, neutrons are highly sensitive to hydrogen content. And uh, by making one measurement here, here and here, and comparing the three spectra, we could differentiate between the signals related to this area, signals related to the wall of the object, and the seer. And we were able to, um, to prove that these are dried hairs which served for the afterlife of the pharaoh. Another combined uh, study was made on, on fossils. So these are uh, so-called sea urchins. And uh, geologists told us that the, the sediment material which are embedded in the inside of these fossils are nice indicators of the sedimentation conditions of those times. 
That's why it was interesting to measure uh, what's encapsulated uh, inside these uh, animals. And by neutron imaging, we could very nicely determine the structure, while by position sensitive uh, element analysis, we made radial uh, element profiling and some uh, very similar uh, element profiles could be uh, obtained along the radius. And uh, uh, the geologists can conclude um, useful information based on these elements. Uh, this uh, position sensitive element analysis can be also used for industrial applications. So this is a, a memory chip. And if you scan it from the bottom to the top, layer by layer, uh, nice uh, structures can be recorded for certain elements. While for other elements, the count rates are very flat and equal. So this way you can dis distinguish between elements present in the baseboard, in the printed circuit, or in the corresponding chips. And this can uh, give guidance to the, the recycling and dismantling of these chips. Another industrial example uh, comes from uh, uh, glass melting industry, where we were requested to check the residual time distribution of uh, a molten glass furnace. And in former times, this was achieved by putting a huge amount of radioactivity into this uh, furnace and measuring the, the radioactivity at the outlet of the furnace. But by PromCam activation analysis, it is possible to do this uh, tracing inactively by uh, adding a tiny bit of gadolinium oxide or boric acid uh, to the glass row components. And this very low amount did not disturb the, the technology by any means. And then inactive samples could be taken regularly at the outlet of the furnace. And later they were transferred to the lab and measured by PGA. And uh, by this knowledge, the company was able to fine tune the operation of this furnace and uh, make it closer to the ideal mixing conditions. And uh, uh, at the end, just a curiosity, uh, PGA is not only available on the Earth, but also in the space. As uh, more and more orbiters are equipped with gamma detectors to map the elemental composition of Mars and other uh, planets. In this case, the excitation is done by cosmic radiation and they uh, reach the surface of the planet and here create uh, nuclear reactions. And these also uh, create gamma radiation, which can be detected by these orbiters. And based on the gamma spectra recorded uh, on, during the fly of these orbiters, uh, the scientists can reconstruct the abundant elements in the surface of a, far, a distant object like a Mars. So coming to the conclusion of my lecture, uh, neutron imaging is one of the most relevant uh, neutron technique for industrial applications and uh, research and development, but also for many scientific fields like uh, cultural heritage science or paleontology. We can uh, subdivide neutron imaging to further categories like radiography or dynamic radiography, which happens in 2D, uh, stroboscopic imaging, which is for repetitive processes. And in 3D, we can mention tomography. We can use neutrons and x-rays uh, together or separately. Uh, they can provide complementary information, but uh, probably the joint interpretation of these two modalities would give you the most uh, information. Uh, neutrons uh, can transilluminate more bulky objects and more heavy objects than X-rays. Uh, 
And so uh, they can help you even in those cases where X-rays would fail. And from uh, these data that we rec record uh, material segmentation and impressive visualizations and animations can be made. And uh, imaging is not, a not only a qualitative tool, but uh, even a quantitative numerical processing of this uh, <coughs> tomography data are possible. So uh, volumes, pore sizes, and casting defects can be identified and quantified. Uh, program activation analysis is another technique where we go for the elemental composition of the samples in a non-destructive way. It is very well applicable when expensive, unique, or time-dependent samples are to be measured. Uh, destructive sampling or dissolution is not allowed. Or uh, it has an exotic matrix where no, there is no matrix matched to standard reference material, which is required by many other methods. We can also make experiments to map the local composition of uh, inhomogeneous samples. Um, major and minor components can be measured, and also some trace elements. And even more trace elements can be measured if we make an additional instrumental neutron activation analysis measurement, which is also possible at our center. And uh, the bulk and local composition can be measured, which is also a significant feature in contrast to X-rays or Pixie or other methods, which are typically surface confined techniques. And uh, this element analysis can also find its niche in, in material science, in cultural heritage science, or geological, uh, paleontological, cosmochemical applications. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And I hope that uh, uh, we have some uh, few minutes to uh, have a look at to this video, which we uh, recorded recently. And uh, I meant that this would be a good uh, summary of my lecture. And at the end, uh, I will take the questions. Experiments of all Budapest Newton Center is the most significant research infrastructure in Hungary and the Newton service provider of Selling Energy. I am Laszlo Sandikovsky and I will present you the two online facilities for from data activation analysis, the PGA and the NICS, and the two imaging facilities, that and more. PGA is a non destructive element analysis technique where we obtain the representative part of composition or a composition of a small confined volume within the object by detecting the gamma radiation emitted during the radiation. The PGA is radiography. We obtain visual information of the sample by transluminating with a particle beam and record its shadow range. At the next normal station, we combine visual information of neutron emission and the composition analysis to study in homogeneous samples. The PGA we collect the gamma spectrum where the energies of the peaks identify the elements why the areas are proportional to their matches. With imaging, we look for different attenuation factors of the sample constituent with 100 to 200 micrometer spatial resolution. Typical materials we analyze the composition are silicates, ceramics, glasses, metals like iron, bronze, or noble metals. Most of the major and minor components, as well as a few base elements, can be quantified. Unlike confusing techniques, it is sensitive to light elements such as hydrogen, boron, or chlorine. For imaging, we can use two neutron beams with different energies and also X rays. This combination ensures that we can visualize the airways, tracks within the complex matter, flow, liquids, uptake of water, and 
filters for their metallic and all their components shall be sound. The present data with high metallurgical quality, so often used as a reference to certify materials for the caliber of other analysis procedures. We can do in situ measurements when complete equipment are installed in the beam line thanks to the high information depths and the time duration of the methods. Besides material science, non destructive analysis, heritage science analysis, and engineering applications are to be managed. Recently, we analyzed soldiering materials inside the articulated Japanese lobster for custom template remains inside the bronze sculpture and to Leonardo da Vinci. So, even non homogeneous objects with such complex shape can be successfully investigated. Thank you.